if you can recognize that you want the, to feel empowered, that you want greater vitality and health, that you want to be able to deal with stress better, that you want to find a community that, that you belong to, things we know are part of what exercise gives us. Um, if you get clear about that, that why, it can help you find the willingness to go. Welcome to the Spartan Decca series on Spartan Up with Jared Cogswell, Director of Sport, and Yancy Culp, Director of Programming. What's up, Spartans? Welcome to the DECA series on the Spartan Up podcast. I'm your co-host, Jared Cogswell, along with my brother, Yancey Cole. And today, we have a very, very special guest. She is an author, psychologist, educator, and lecturer at Stanford University, and one of the most excellent speakers I've ever heard. You'll, you'll, you'll see her TED Talk after this is all done. And her mission is to connect lift one another up, amplify what is good in humanity to support the communities that bring out the best in us. You guys, I'm talking about Kelly McGonigal. Today's episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Nutrafol, clinically shown to improve hair growth and thickness naturally. Go to Nutrafol.com and enter the code SPARTAN to save $15 off your first month's subscription. That's N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com and the code SPARTAN. Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And I know that Spartan is one of those communities that brings the best out in people. So I'm super excited about our conversation. Yeah, so are we. Hey, you know what? Before we get started, you know, I, I think we all kind of have something in common here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're all group fitness coaches. You know, and yeah. when I when I when I was learning a little bit more about you, I just thought that okay, we're gonna have a good time on today's episode. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing out there in the group fitness world. Oh yes, you know, group fitness is what I'm most passionate about. So even though most people know me through my work in psychology, um, I've been teaching group movement since 2000. Everything from I started with like old school aerobics and strength training and boot camp. Um, yoga, cardio, dance. Um, I'm now teaching six dance classes a week, both at Stanford with students and at a local community center. Um, and it, I truly believe that of everything that I have done in my professional life, it is the greatest contribution that I make to the world because I know how collective movement experiences change people's lives. And it also is the thing that brings me the greatest joy. You know, I taught a dance class this morning to um, a group of uh, older women. And we, it, it, just to see the connection that happens, we got to express our emotions. We got to touch into strength and beauty and sensuality and power and fun. And um, I just feel so lucky that I get to do it every day. Mm. Oh, I love it. So I love it. There's a statement that you said, and I can't even remember where I heard you say it, but our CEO, Joe DeSena, who's the owner, founder, creative Spartan, I knew he would love it. So I had to work this in. You said, learn to tolerate the sensations of discomfort. Mm. And I, I, you know, I, I want to make sure you go there today and however you want to take that, because at a minimum, our CEO is going to eat this podcast up and we're going to poke, maybe we'll poke him a little bit that he didn't get you to hang out with him and the monks. So <laughs> yeah. I promise you, we'll leave that in this podcast, my friend. Um, so, okay, let's talk about that because that is a cornerstone of my work in every area, whether we're talking about behavior change and, and things like willpower and addiction, whether we're talking about getting good at stress and becoming resilient, or we're talking about movement and exercise. And, you know, the basic core idea is that Human beings have a natural instinct to want to avoid discomfort. And so we have a lot of habits that pull us away from anything that is new, scary, uncomfortable, challenges our limits. Um, and a lot of those instincts are harmful. A lot of what we would think of as our most self-destructive impulses are basically an attempt to avoid discomfort, whether we are you know, trying to annihilate our consciousness with substances that aren't great for us, or we are avoiding a conversation that uh, we are anxious about, or we decide to give up on a training plan because we don't like that while we're doing it, we feel out of breath, or we have to stop and take breaks. It's not easy. And so, you know, the idea of learning to tolerate discomfort is really, it begins with getting clear on um, who and what you care about. 
so that you can tolerate discomfort in service of your goals and your values. And that's it's not for the sake of pain. It's not like there's no higher calling than being uncomfortable, but it's that if you want to do things that are meaningful and important, they are also going to be stressful. They will be difficult. You will experience failure. That is the only way that we learn and grow. It's the only way we contribute um, going outside of our comfort zone. And so, you know, at the very basic level, we need distress tolerance. And, uh, you know, there's lots of ways you can learn it. Of course, I happen to believe that movement is one of the best ways to learn it because every form of movement, even the ones people think are going to be easy, carry their own versions of discomfort, even something like yoga, where people think it's going to be relaxing and then they're holding a stretch and they're like, why does, why do my hamstrings feel this way? And when is the instructor going to let me get out of it? Yeah, you know, when you bring that up, Kelly, you, you made me think the, the other day uh, I did a climb with a friend of mine and, you know, we weren't roped and, and there was this one section in, and I, I've been climbing for years, but it's it's been a while since I've been on something vertical like we were on the other day, no rope. And there was a little bit of fear, you know, like, and, and you know what, it was one of those things that, okay, this is a little scary, but I like it. And I, I needed this, you know, like everything else was too comfortable and I wasn't growing from those, those previous climbs. Right. And so when you were talking about that discomfort, you know, that's, I was feeling like, okay, you, you go through this, you get through this and you're going to, you're going to be way better on the other side. It, would you would you equate fear as part of that discomfort equation? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. And actually, I think that you know when you said you liked it, what was flashing through my mind is one of the things that I did when I was working on my last book was I decided to tackle my fear of heights through climbing. And my version is going to seem you know ridiculously simple to maybe someone like you. I went to a climbing gym because I'd had the the previous experience where I could literally only get about twenty feet off the ground before I would practically have a panic attack. And I'd never been able to get higher on a climbing wall because I just had this overwhelming sense of, I can't be here. I can't be here. I need to come down. And uh, I decided to work through that. And I think that, so we all need our version of that mm -hmm. as well as the kind of thing that you're describing, which is sort of like, oh, well, I'm not hundred percent comfortable here, but I need this to grow. That's a great place to be. But I also mean like, we have to go to the places where um, it's a real challenge. You know, I learned more from that particular climb because in order to do it, I had to trust the support of um, my climbing partner. I had to be inspired by a little boy who was climbing next to me, who was about 10 years old, and he was having so much fun. I, so, like literally his joy was contagious and that helped me overcome my fear. I had to think about someone who I interviewed for the book who, who does, you know, Everest level climbs and how she told me how she dealt with her fear that she actually had also been terrified of heights when she started. And I, I had in my mind her as an inspiration. And I had to draw on all of these things in order to keep putting, you know, one hand over the other and one, one, you know, reach at a time. That's the kind of discomfort. I mean, the real discomfort, um, where it requires you to expand your coping resources. Um, I mean, that's also one of the great things about the really big challenges in um, in fitness or exercise or, or movement, which is that uh, if you're really in the place that's going to help you grow, you aren't going to be able to do it on your own. And I really believe that is one of the biggest benefits of, of learning to tolerate discomfort is when you are forced to abandon this mentality that it's all on you. You alone can do it. You shouldn't ask for help. You should already be able to do it. This mindset that a lot of people have um, that is tremendously limiting in terms of what we're able to eventually accomplish and achieve. So, um, yeah. So I don't know, like, were you, when you were feeling the fear, was it that level or is there something else you have to do in order to get to that level where it's the holy bleep, I don't want to do this moment? Nah, it, it wasn't that. It, it, it was, it, it felt good. It, it felt like, it felt familiar, you know, and yeah. I'm like, okay. And we're, you've trained we're for that too. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, you've trained to be able to tolerate some of that discomfort and fear. Yeah, for and all I, of you, I think it, I think for it was just you, something that makes you feel kind of like you're you're really alive in the moment. But I'll yeah. tell you what, well, if you, you if might you like put the adrenaline of that, if you put a ladder in front of me, I'm not getting on that thing though. <laughs> <laughs> for, for all you spin instructors out there, Kelly got over the fear of flying by going to a spin class. I love oh that. I love that story. 
yeah. love that story. That um, is that is so funny too because the, there is um, I got over my fear of flying by doing that, and I also became a spin instructor, a Schwinn uh, cycling instructor because of that, because I. I hated it so much. It was what reminded me the most of being on an airplane. I can't breathe. I can't get out of here. I'm trapped in this little uncomfortable seat. There are too many people close to me. Um, it was just like this overwhelming feeling of claustrophobia and I can't breathe and I hate this. And uh, learning to try to embrace the sensations of discomfort, learning to tune into the music, which is about the only thing that's gonna save me in a situation like that is music that feels empowering. Um, made me not only be able to do it on an airplane where I, you know, I learned to deal with my fear of turbulence by listening to my cycling playlist during turbulence, um, that I, I loved cycling so much that I got certified in it. And I think that is the other great thing about, um, embracing discomfort is how it, it changes us that sometimes we have this fixed mindset that things I hate, I'll always hate things I'm not good at. I'll never be good at. We have the sense of who we are. And often when we put ourselves in a place that challenges us, that makes us feel uncomfortable, and ideally a place where we are encouraged and supported as well, where we can find a connection between that challenge and something we care about or an aspect of ourselves that we want to cultivate, like for me, courage, um, what we find is that that experience helps us fall in love with parts of ourselves, with communities, with activities, um, and to be able to experience that transformation is in and of itself one of those great like mindset interventions to for me to be able to look back and say that there's something I thought I hated that now, you know, that I fell in love with because I was able to pay attention to my values and how that situation supported my values. It was, you know, that's more reason to try. We'll be right back to this interview. But first a message from today's sponsor. Nutrafol. Nutrafol is physician formulated to be 100% drug free. That's why they're on our show. They use natural medical grade botanicals in consistently effective dosages so that you get the most reliable results. When it comes to thinning hair, you do not have to choose between natural remedies and remedies that work. Nutrafol is a holistic solution and it promotes healthier hair and a whole body wellness without drugs or prescriptions. Nutrafol is the hair supplement that goes beyond genetics and it targets stress, hormones, nutrition, metabolism, and environmental factors that could be impacting your hair. You can grow thicker hair by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code SPARTAN. You'll save $15 off your first month's subscription. This is their best offer anywhere, and it's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time. So one more time, that's Nutrafol.com, N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L, Dot com and use the code Spartan to save that $15. Yeah. So, you know, go ahead. Go ahead, JC. Go ahead, JC. Well, I, I'm thinking, you know, we've, we're talking about discomfort, fear, and, and overcoming challenges. Um, and I know, it, I, I know you really um, have put a lot of thought into just the whole willpower theme, mm -hmm. you know, um, how do you develop the will to overcome that? Like, like what's going to get you out of that space to try new things that may challenge you, scare you, because those, that's the audience that we all deal with, right? Mm -hmm. We're, you know, we have some people that won't come to the gym or a class in any setting simply because of fear, not just because of the physical challenge. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, a big part of it is willingness. So before you can have willpower, you need willingness, which is this, you know, psychologists would say that's your, you, you understand what you want or what you care about well enough that you want to put yourself in positions that help you get what you want or be who you want to be. Um, so that gives you this kind of willingness that's very different from like wanting to do something. So people can be willing to do things because they value the outcome, even if some part of them really, really does not want to be there because of fear or because of fatigue or because of, you know, negative experiences in the past. Um, lots of people feel that way about, about exercise. I mean, lots of people have had traumatizing experiences related to movement or fitness, whether it's back in PE class or, you know, whether it's being harassed at the gym or while running on the street. I mean, people have all sorts of um, experiences that can make them immediately want to just say, no, this is not for me. Um, 
So part of it is figuring out what your why is. And, you know, even though, you know, I am, uh, you know, practically like an evangelist for movement, I also think it's really important to recognize people's autonomy. Nobody has to exercise. Nobody has to do anything. But if you can recognize that you want the, to feel empowered, that you want greater vitality and health, that you want to be able to deal with stress better, that you want to find a community that, that you belong to, things we know are part of what exercise gives us. Um, if you get clear about that, that why, it can help you find the willingness to go. But I know, you know we had chatted a little bit about uh, wanting to get into some of the scientific stuff that's so cool. So let me teach you a mindset reset that you can use while you're actually in the middle of exercising to help you develop more willpower. I just think this is, this is one of the coolest studies. Um, and I do use this. In fact, I used it this morning while I was doing um, a high intensity interval training workout that literally I was on the floor in the middle. Usually I wait till the end to lie down on the floor and like, <sighs> like I can't move. So that was about halfway through when that happened today. Okay. So this was a study that had people do strength training and some of them were told to remember when they wanted to give up or quit um, that this was good for them, that it would make them stronger, just to connect to the essential meaning of it, to really reflect on it. And what they found was that those people could not only endure longer, so they were physically stronger as a result of it, um, but they also looked at what happened to their brain chemistry as a result of doing that during their workout. And what they found is that the brains release higher levels of two types of chemicals, endorphins and endocannabinoids. And these are the two types of brain chemicals most responsible for the exercise high. Uh, and they also, they relieve pain and increase energy. Um, so the, the, this is what I think is so fascinating. So first of all, it's fascinating that there is such a thing as the exercise high, which is when you, when you exercise, your brain wants to reward you by releasing chemicals that give you energy, that improve your mood, that help you endure. Um, that even help you connect with other people because endorphins and endocannabinoids are also social bonding molecules. So, you know, whoever you exercise with, you're likely to bond with in part because of the chemistry of the exercise high. Um, you're like hopped up on an, an inner drug that makes you like the people you're around and all of that. Um, but like that thinking about the why of your workout can increase your exercise high in ways that help you perform better and enjoy it more, and connect more with whoever you have to be working out with. Um, so I, I feel like there's a lot of little things like that where you, you might hear that these pieces of, of advice that seem sort of trite, like remember your why. But it's not remember your why for no reason. It's remember your why because your mindset can alter every aspect of your chemistry in ways that can dramatically transform your experience. And you, know, you mentioned my TED Talk. I talk a little bit about some mindset resets that can do the same thing for your physical response to stress so that it's healthier. There's a whole bunch of these things where just, just bringing something to your mind changes what's happening in your body. Oh my gosh, we had a couple mic drops there with the movement evangelist. I love that. And uh, the why, oh my gosh. We got to dive a little deeper into your 2013 TED Talk, which pulled millions of people to the edge of their seat. And when you're watching that, and I, I'll be honest, today was the first time I've watched it. But there were times when the camera was behind you looking out into the crowd and you just saw these people like on the edge of their seat. Oh, you really? Just, I've never you, watched it. <laughs> you flipped the script for them kind of like at some point in time prior to that, the script was kind of flipped for you. And you're like, wait a second, yeah. I've been telling these people for 10 years and I had my epiphany because of that study that had 30,000 people studied over over eight years. Give our audience mm -hmm. that the, the epiphany moment that you had when you started after you studied that eight year study. Yeah. Okay. And so let me be clear about the epiphany too, because one of those things So in retrospect, now that 27 million people have watched that Ted talk, I kind of wish I'd been clearer about something, um, which is about sort of what, what I think this study means. So here's the study. This is a study that, that tracked, as you said, like 30,000 adults for almost a decade. They asked them how stressful their lives were. And then they waited to see who died because we, you know, we want to know, is it true that stress kills? And they also snuck in this really interesting question. Um, do you believe that stress is bad for you? And the, the big thing that jumped out at me when they published this paper a decade later is that stress increased your risk of dying only if you believed that stress is very bad for you. 
and among the people who had the most stressful lives but did not strongly believe that stress was bad for them, they were the most likely to be alive at the end of the study. So it's this weird, interesting interaction where somehow having a lot of stress and really strongly believing that stress is bad for you was predicting death from all causes. So the reason that that horrified me is as a health psychologist, I had been taught that like the most important thing you could ever communicate to the public was that stress is bad for you and that stress will kill you. I mean, literally, that is every other thing you hear in your training as a health psychologist is stress is the enemy. Stress is the reason that everything goes wrong with your immune system, your heart, your brain, you name it. Stress is always the ultimate enemy. In fact, most people actually try to reduce. If there's anything else that's bad for you, it's because it's stressful. And, and then stress and then heart attack and then death. And so get rid of stress. So I'd been out there preaching that idea. I thought I was doing some good in the world. And this study was saying like, hey, maybe that mindset is not actually the most useful way to think about stress. So the reason that that, that study was a big aha moment for me was because it made me rethink what I was teaching and it made me investigate the science more rigorously to find out if there's anything to this idea that how you think about stress can interact with stress to create a different state in your body, a different health outcome, a different type of performance, whether in a competition or a negotiation. And it turns out that that is true. It's called the stress mindset effect. And now, uh, you know, a decade after I gave that talk, almost a decade after I gave that talk, there is so much more research confirming that idea. But here's what I, I want to clarify. So many people thought the takeaway of that talk, and maybe they only watched the first couple of minutes, was if you think stress is bad for you, you're going to die, which was sort of, that's <laughs> like, just n no, <laughs> I, I don't. Yeah. And it, it's not this it's not the simplistic idea that stress is either all good or all bad or that like if you accidentally have the thought that stress is bad you've just you know destroyed your chances of a happy healthy life. It really is this empowering idea that there are ways of thinking about stress that can change your biology, that can change your performance, that can change how other people perceive you, that can change your relationships and uh, one of the the mindsets that I talk about in that talk because it's the best researched is that if you are experiencing what's called performance stress, so there's something you care about and you want to do well, and it could be in sports, it could be giving a talk, it could be uh, a, a negotiation, it could be uh, you're a musician, whatever it is, you just, you want to show up and be your best self. Um, that if you embrace stress and tell yourself that it's energy you can harness, you will walk out of that negotiation with a better outcome, you will be more likely to have a personal best in an athletic competition, you'll be more likely to sing on pitch in a karaoke competition. I mean, people have looked at everything you can imagine. Students do better on uh, really important exams. Um, any sort of outcome you can measure that is the thing you actually care about, you do better, and your stress response is healthier. Different types of stress hormones, different effects on your heart and your blood vessels in ways that are really healthy, not this kind of toxic stress we're so afraid of. And so that's another example. It's like remembering your why in a workout will give you an exercise high and um, telling yourself that stress is energy you can harness will make your stress response healthier and help you perform your best under pressure. Uh, JC, I want to go to, I want to go to, I want to attend one of Kelly's classes like tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Um, how best to reach you uh, on your website? Um, can you tell us? Yeah. Uh, if you go to kellymcgonigal.com, there's an email form. Um, I do read my own DMs on Instagram, so you can try that. Uh, those probably be the two best places. Awesome. We'll, we'll post that in the in the notes. But uh, thank you so much. Where can okay. we find your book at, too? Oh, go ahead. Um, Lots everywhere. of books. Yeah. This is the the fabulous most recent one. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're everywhere. And of course, I've read um, the last two. I've done my own audiobook. So for people who love uh, Audible or audiobooks, and I always say like, okay, now you've heard my voice, so you know whether you can tolerate it for six hours. <laughs> Some people can't. Today's episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Nutrafol, clinically shown to improve hair growth and thickness naturally. Go to Nutrafol.com and enter the code SPARTAN to save $15 off your first month's subscription. That's N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com and the code SPARTAN. Thanks for listening to this episode of the DECA series on Spartan Up Podcast. 
Spartan Up is your partner in resilience for mind, body, and spirit. We're here three days every week. Tuesdays, you can find Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan, interviewing biohackers, business leaders, authors, and athletes. Thursdays and Saturdays, catch episodes from our DECA, Endurance, Trail, Combat, and La Ruta series. Do you know someone who needs a little nudge? Maybe they could use some motivation, tactics to be stronger, healthier, happier, more successful. Tell them about our show. And if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. We want to know who's watching and who's listening. Thanks. See you next time.